I love a quiet room. So hello, welcome to our final afternoon here at SMCR conference. <laughs> Apparently people are excited about that. <laughs> My name is Mindy Ertel and I'm the awards coordinator for this year's conference. And that means I have the wonderful privilege of hosting our award ceremony this afternoon. So over the next hour, we're going to present a number of different awards to recognize people both for their work at this conference, within the organization, and in the world at large related to menstrual cycle research, service, and activism. So, I would like to begin with our two student awards. So these awards are given and given at every conference, by annually, I guess, at every conference, to recognize students who present particularly high quality research related to some aspects of the menstrual cycle. Every year that I've been attending SMCR conferences, it has been filled with wonderful student research, and this year is no exception. And it is always a hard thing to both publicly recognize two individuals while not being able to publicly recognize all the others. So first, let me thank all of the students who presented such amazing research this weekend. So thank you all. So the first of our awards in this category is the Linda McKeever Award. Linda McKeever was a dedicated women's health advocate, and in her doctoral research, she describes women's models of menopause, portraying the normal perimenopausal process. Before her untimely death from a brain tumor in the early 1990s, Linda was an active participant in the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research, and this award named in her honor recognizes outstanding work done by a student. This year's recipient of the McKeever Award is Amy Dryden for her work on young women's constructions of their post-cancer facility. is the Esther Rome Award. Esther Rome was a tireless women's health advocate as a member of both the Boston Women's Health Collective and the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research. Among other interests, she was passionate about tampon safety, and her testimony before Congress on tampon absorbency was influential in pushing the industry to provide some standardized absorbency information on tampon packaging for consumers. She presented regularly at SMCR conferences and served on the SMCR Board of Directors until her untimely death from breast cancer in the mid-1990s. So this award honors both Esther and her work, as well as the work of the student who presented at this conference. And this award goes to Sanaya Gahouni, Gahouni, sorry, Gahouni, for for menstrual documentary, menstrual education films of the 1970s. I'd like to ask SM Series President Ingrid Johnson Arbledo to come up to talk about the next award that will be presented. <coughs> uh, the next award that we would like to give out is the Mariana Friedrich Service Award. And as you can see in your program, Mariana Friedrich served as our secretary treasurer on the board for 26 years. Wow. So this was back when those two roles were combined. 
So she is a founding mother of the society. After attending a St. Louis conference in 1978, she volunteered to serve on the original steering committee that followed this conference to form the society. So this award is given to an individual who has made outstanding and unusual service contributions to our organization, and it's not given out at every conference. So this individual um, has served our organization extensively in many different capacities. She joined the board in 1999 and has served continuously ever since. She was the president from 2001 uh, to 2003, where she organized um, a really great conference in Avon, Connecticut. Um, she has chaired multiple board meetings when current presidents were unavailable. That does happen on occasion. She distributed and produced conference proceedings, has edited special issues of three different journals that came from conference papers here through the conference. Um, she's also um, launched our brand new journal, Women in Reproductive Health, and is the inaugural editor. Uh, most special for me, she has mentored many students who have presented research at this conference, who have won awards, and who have taken on leadership roles in the society. And she was also the recipient of the Ann Voda Award for Lifetime Achievement in Order Research. Um, and I think many of us wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. So it's my distinct honor to give this award to my mentor and dear friend, Joan Chrysler. recipient is delayed. Um, I had to break the news to her to wrangle her into the room. Um, so I hope that she'll come in in a blaze of glory as I conclude this acknowledgement. And she'll wonder, she'll know why we're clapping. <clears throat> For most of us here, Liz Kisling needs a little introduction as her work is so visible, relevant, and far-reaching. And that is precisely why we honor her today. Liz is professor of women's studies, women's and gender studies and communication studies at Eastern Washington University. Her work intersects women's health, sexuality, embodiment, and feminism, especially as these deliciously messy issues are represented in entertainment media. Her oft-cited and groundbreaking, capitalizing on the curse, the business of menstruation, is a touchstone for any student of the creeping and insidious processes of commodification of the menstrual cycle. But what makes Liz especially essential to SNCR has been the way she, herself a feminist media studies expert, has refused to stop at critique. She has led our organization in taking back the discourse of menstruation. Wow. Liz spearheaded and project managed the development of our current logo, the clever blend of the woman's symbol, which is actually the astrological sign for Venus, a moon, and a magnifying glass. Everyone pause and look closely. <laughs> she managed the creation of our website and continues to this day in the role of website manager, which meant she graciously put up with my many harried requests over the last few years. Liz, please update this. <laughs> around the same time, Liz began blogging um, around the same time that she uh, took on that task, she began blogging for the venerable Ms. Magazine blog, pushing her own unique brand of whip-smart feminist analysis out into the world. Fat shaming, body art, disappearing diaphragm, and more. And I, for one, hope she never stops doing that. Sorry, technical problems. <clears throat> 
She, um, but a particular note is her forward thinking, geek girl know-how and tenacity in founding and managing our one-of-a-kind blog, Recycling. I remember the board meeting in Spokane in which Liz made the suggestion to establish the blog. And this was in the midst of organizing the conference. And I, as a conference organizer, can tell you, I can't imagine she could think about anything else. So that alone, I think, is award-winning. She made a compelling case at the board meeting for an organ where we, as a small group of interdisciplinary mental health researchers, could do public intellectual work, where we could make menstruation matter far beyond our usual scholarly circles. Some of us were skeptical. Some of us had never even heard the word blog. This was 2009. <laughs> but we trusted Liz. Now, six years later, um, now six years later, countless pithy, smart, sly posts of her own and countless more curated and edited by Liz populate the blog. Plus, Liz's signature weekend links, a rundown of menstrual news, not to be missed. Liz is stepping down as the executive editor of Recycling, and the blog is undergoing a reorganization. So this is the perfect time to say, oh, and I'm so sad that she's not in the room, but you will tell her I said so, right? Liz Kisling, we see and value your service to SNCR and to so many others far beyond our organization. With this award, we acknowledge your vision, your grit, and your commitment to feminism on the ground. Nancy Rehm, long time member yes. of SMCR. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Is here to present our feature award, the Making Menstruation Matter Award. Yes, it was such an honor, such a privilege to do this. Um, if, you'll rem if you haven't had a chance, take a look at page 47, which actually describes uh, this award and its history. It's actually the only the second time we've officially uh, designated an award. Gloria Steinem, as you know, two years ago at our last meeting was the first recipient. Um, it, it's clearly a no-brainer that we would honor this fabulous organization, uh, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. I know we don't say that anymore. It's our bodies, ourselves. And its founding members and director, Judy Nersugin, uh, because of the unbelievable uh, amazing leadership of this organization of 40 years and counting. Um, and it's such an honor for me to have been asked to uh, bestow this award today. Uh, we go back as menstrual si sisters many, many, many years ago. In the late 70s, I was just graduating as a physiologist uh, and uh, I had been studying the menstrual cycle ac actually in, in primates, in rhesus monkeys. And I went to a, a Society of the Study of Reproduction, all male, basic scientists, and there was one other woman there, and we kind of gravitated to each other, and it turned out she was a new graduate, new physiologist. She said, I've just been hired by Kimberly Clark. They make, paper, they make toilet paper and they make Kotex, and they hired me to be, be in charge of the lab because none of these paper product guys wanted anything to do with with tampons, and she said, I don't know where to go, so I came to this meeting hoping I could find somebody, and none of these guys want to talk about <coughs> menstruation, and this was just when toxic shock was really getting attention, because women were dying, young women were dying, and, and we were just no beginning to notice these uh, special high-risk uh, groups and, and the use of the Rely tampon. And so she said, would you just consult with me and come to Nina, Wisconsin? I had no clue where that was. And, and let's talk about some studies we might do with real women. They only use saline, that, which is salt water, that's dyed blue, in the pa and it's paper chemists who work on these products. And I just thought it might make sense that maybe we should... Uh, we should use menstrual blood. And I said, oh, sure, I'm an OB nurse. I know where to get lots of menstrual blood in postpartum women. It's no problem. And she said, you know, I feel a little bit funny because the reason that I got hired into this job is because I was the only candidate that could actually draw 
one of the questions was, could you draw the anatomy of the human vagina? And the other candidates were men, and they said, well, I could, I, once I knew how to draw the, the reproductive system of the guinea pig and the hamster, but I really didn't know. So that was the basis back in the 70s, and she got that job, and they did, we did go on to do some interesting studies. And because of that work, uh, the number one fabulous go-to women's health uh, activist group in the country at the time and still were the ones that the FDA contacted uh, when all of this discussion and concern and worry was, was going on around the, the safety and the guidelines for how do you make tampons and why does one uh, brand's uh, super is another brand's light and junior and, and who better than to ask the folks who, who brought uh, women's health and menstruation to the public and to the, that discussion and who knew more about women's experiences than the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. So they, when they formed this task force to start to develop the safety guidelines, all of the makers, all of the commercial tampon brand company manufacturers were there at the table, one representative from each corporation, I used to know them all by heart, Johnson & Johnson, Kimberly Clark, on and on, um, and their attorney, they were always in the room, and the FDA funded this uh, a task force that went on for years, and uh, the, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective said, we need, we need that same level of uh, presence at these tables, we want to be there. And so Esther Rome was nominated as the representative, and then she asked me to join as their uh, lab consultant. So I became the lab at the University of Michigan who did the same studies in the lab around absorbency and tampon safety. And so from there we just, and then I had the great fortune of working with her on many uh, of the uh, menstrual cycle chapters in, in our bodies ourselves for many, many editions. So it's just such a wonderful opportunity to honor her and honor you for all the wonderful things. And what a great timing to give you this award, given the attention you're getting again in this fabulous new film. We're going to show a clip of uh, She's Beautiful When She's Angry. Is that right? Yes. And it's already won several awards, and Judy's going to talk about it, but first let's, let's show this. We'll cut to the chase. 25 million books later, 30 translated in 30 countries, and how many languages? Here we are today. Um, and it is such an honor uh, to present this fabulous award. And I just want to quote the wonderful uh, articulate uh, phrasing, I guess. I'm not sure who, who did this. Did Chris do this? It was fabulous. We honor this group for these efforts and in particular their pioneering historic work around improving feminine care product safety through the activism spearheaded by Esther Rome and menstrual health and awareness more generally. There is no doubt our bodies ourselves makes menstruation matter in enduringly profound ways. So with that, Judy Norsegian, it is my honor to present you with this fabulous award. Is the, um, is the artist here? Is Jen Lewis still here? Jen Lewis? Yes, please. Tell, uh, she has been uh, showing her beautiful art here. This is one of the series of her photographs. Oh, gorgeous. Of, uh, Jen Lewis. Paparazzi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's on that on the side. Where we're going to be fighting over who gets to go. Um, no, you need to get back. So, um, first of all, it's such a pleasure to join all of you, and I bring greetings from the staff, the board, the founders, and I'll give you a little update on what's happening with our bodies or cells in a few minutes. Um, before I forget, I have two of our 40th anniversary tote bags, and if any of you want to get one, if you make a donation of $25 to the uh, Menstrual Cycle Research, S-M-C-R, right. Um, you, you can take one today or you can give me a check and we can um, send you something later. Uh, I have a problematic knee now so I couldn't do my usual lugging of boxes. I also want to say that um, 
Esther was the first founder of Our Bodies, Our Cells to die. Um, this June will make it exactly 20 years. And we shared an office. And she uh, it was quite a compelling partner. And in fact, when the first meeting started to happen with the um, what was it, the American Society for Testing and Materials, the ASTM, which is wrong in some of the textbooks. Sometimes they put it ATSM, and it's not quite the right acronym. Uh, Esther asked me to go down to the first meetings because she had something that she needed to do, and you can't say no to Esther. And this, you, you understand, the book, the section on menstruation, on anatomy and physiology, it was her baby. And we all learned about it, but she was the real sort of go-getter. And so I went down there and I started to make friends with the lawyers and the folks from Kimberly Clark and Tampax and, um, and the FDA people were there. I, and we were just beginning to learn about toxic shock. But I did it because it was important to Esther and it was work Obos had to be doing. We called ourselves Obos even back then. We, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective is still our legal name. You can use it. But we kind of went with the flow because nobody called us that after some years. They just called, oh, you are here. I just emailed you. Great. Um, we also shared a lot about our family life. And she was, for me, one of the beacons in the group. Just such a visionary. And it's... Um, it's really hard to think that it's going to have been 20 years in just a couple of weeks. But we continue to do work in her memory, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. One of the projects that Our Bodies Ourselves has done for years, um, we've been doing it largely in her memory, and I will talk about that in a second. Before I forget, I do want to say something about this film, which some civil rights activists and others who've been in the trenches for 30, 40 years or more have said is the best film about community organizing that they've seen. Because it's not about the famous people in the movement. It's about all the people at the grassroots level who made a movement happen. And that was actually true in the civil rights movement too, although we absolutely had to have our Martin Luther Kings. And it didn't hurt to have Gloria Steinem and leaders and Shirley Chisholm and people who were really quite famous, prominent, and, and, and carried the banner in such a wonderful way. But movements don't work with just famous people. They have to have large numbers of grassroots activists. And this film depicts that beautifully. If you are an institution that has not yet bought the film, I think it's about $385 from Cinema Guild, and by the way, it is their best-selling documentary at the moment. If you get them to buy the film, I promise you that I'll come out there at no charge, and I might even get another co-founder to come to be part of the talk back. We've done that several times. Last Friday night at Music Hall in Portsmouth, Norma Swenson and um, Miriam Hawley both went up to Portsmouth and had a rousing conversation with hundreds of people who came to that screening. We had some great screenings and talkbacks here at the Coolidge Theater. And if any of you are local and want to arrange a small, shall we say, uh, home screening, I can do that for you. But it can't be in a public setting. And we will have to ask for donations for the filmmaker. Mary Dore is still in debt from making one of the best films about the women's movement ever. So I want you all to think about ways you can get the film rented, 100 something dollars, buy the film for your institution. I do not believe that personal sales are actually in place yet. There will be a lower figure for personal purchases, but not yet. So. It's not just that this is giving us, um, you know, our bodies, ourselves, another bit of recognition. It's really extraordinary what's done in terms of activists in Chicago, in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Berkeley, in New York City. You will see some amazing stories told in this film. Volunia Diskin, who's featured in that clip, has actually been taped by CNN, which is doing a big feature on the 70s, starting next week, I think. And it's going to continue into July, maybe August. And the part that deals with our bodies ourselves that she was interviewed for will be in July sometime. So we have an opportunity to sort of revitalize that spirit of the 70s. Um, I also want to say, in the spirit of 
wonderful activist. Um, this, in this instance, it's someone who just recently died, but we had a glorious memorial celebration for her life. Sheila Kitzinger, how many of you knew her? What, the most famous childbirth educator in the world. She died in April at 86, and we arranged to have a wonderful uh, obituary written in the New York Times. But it's really the UK publications that have done a better job of chronicling what she's contributed. Her work is just um, has been amazing. And her husband, Uwe Kitzinger, was in um, Boston for about two and a half weeks, and we had a wonderful service for her at the Newton Highlands Congregational Church on May 27th. And my partner, Craig Norberg Bohm, used my cell phone to tape most of it. And what we've got are clips that will be um, YouTube links. And we'll have a blog at Our Bodies Ourselves whenever that's ready for you to not only hear from people like Diane Young, who was editor of Birth, that famous journal till recently, but other people who knew and worked with her, have them speak about what she meant to them. And even younger women who never met her, but who knew her work very well. The president of Lamaze International was there, a woman with eight children for whom Sheila was her primary mentor. So if you're interested in her memoir, the 33rd or fourth book she wrote, ended writing this, I think, in December. It's called A Passion for Birth. I actually have a few copies. It's not available in the United States till July, so you can get in touch with me about that. It's a wonderful read. Now, um, back to our bodies ourselves. We are, as some of you know, going through a very difficult period. Like many nonprofits, financially we have been struggling for years. Several years ago, I told the board and the staff that I needed to step down as executive director, and I had been the primary fundraiser, because I needed to start working on climate change, particularly fossil fuel divestment efforts. And the impetus for this wasn't really um, that I just had been following the issue that closely, like a lot of you, I signed petitions and I followed the issues and I'm part of the Harvard divest movement, but I started to have dreams about babies dying in climate disasters and I don't dream. So that was for me the first sort of, you've got to do something. And then on college campuses, and I was on about 40 campuses a year, young women would come up to me and say, what is our bodies ourselves doing about climate change? And as you know, well know, and there is some research beginning, and even when it comes to reproductive health, we are now being able to see that this is going to have an impact on pretty much everything. But I was, I was worried about sort of the bigger picture issues, you know, um, especially people in countries less well resourced where we're seeing already so many climate disasters and people dying by the thousands because of that. And nothing being done about keeping all those fossil fuels in, in the ground rather than exhuming them and then burning them. And very little done in terms of political will to make sure that we put more energy into establishing renewables and we cut back on, cut out eventually, our dependence on fossil fuels. And as I've um, learned about this issue and I've talked to more undergraduates, I decided that's what I needed to do for my next steps. Um, and when I said this a couple, almost a couple of years ago to the board and the staff, I wasn't about to sort of, you know, jump out the window, but I wanted to have a, a transition. It was difficult because we are a small organization. I don't get paid that much. I hadn't gotten paid that much. And so to think about uh, a successor for me was a little difficult, partly because of the, the budget that we were required to get a new executive director, and also that our forecasting wasn't that promising around fundraising. So after a short period, about six months, when the board realized it couldn't raise the money to really hire a successor, we went into uh, a different mode. And we had thought about this earlier, it wasn't new to us, and that was to find a merger partner. Somebody, uh, an organization where our bodies ourselves could fold in, partner in some way, and then come out all the stronger uh, with a partner organization. And we looked at about 42 institutions, some of them educational, some of them nonprofit, 501c3s, and as some of you would guess, one of the, um, the groups that would be at the top of the list for many of us was the National Women's Health Network. The big hoop there was not the, the book, the website, you know, all of our work, advocacy work in this country, where we work hand in glove all the time on all these issues, including the flabanserin debate that you probably all followed on Thursday. 
it was the w fact that we do global work. And you heard an allusion to the fact there are 33 or 4 translation adaptations. We have global partners we're doing amazing projects all around the world. And we wanted to find an ally that was interested in supporting the global work as well as the domestic work. And increasingly, we think there's a need for um, global domestic advocacy on most issues that we confront. Obviously, the abortion debate is everywhere, but it takes different forms. But we, in our discussions with the network, they are going through a, a kind of strategic planning process, and they weren't quite ready to take on what isn't even in their mission statement, working globally. So that didn't work. And then we went to pursue other options, and none of them worked out. The most recent was with Hesperian Health Guides, formerly the Hesperian Foundation. We thought they were primarily global, and they have been, but they were interested in doing much more domestic work. So now we're back uh, kind of at square one. But as of January 1, I've no longer been executive director. We have four amazing part-time program staff. You probably know them if you read our website or our blog uh, and, or if you've been involved at all in our global initiative. And the person who was our operations manager, although she did take a full-time job, she has a family and needed to you know, get back up to her part-time work for us, uh, she is working 10 to 15 hours a week to do payroll and the basics. And I'm supporting a little bit her and certainly the program staff because some of the projects we're working on, I'm never going to leave, uh, no matter what else I do, because they're dear to my heart. And um, we're hoping to really gear up a major fundraising effort starting this summer. We have a major donor who's considering a gift, and maybe we can get ourselves back on our feet, and maybe we can go a while without having an executive director. It's, of all the organizations I know, this is the one that could actually do it, because the four, now five, uh, uh, if you act, include the operations manager, these five people have 80 years of combined experience in the organization, way more than all the years of experience that our board members have had. So it's an extraordinary group of people, and we are really very fortunate to have this kind of dedicated and really savvy staff. So I am now uh, going to say a little bit about the work we're doing now, and I'm continuing to fundraise as a volunteer, not in quite the same way, and other founders are working with me as well. Six founders, not myself, but six founders have gone on to the, back onto the board of directors and want to really make this happen. And I am starting to work with colleagues in other cities to see if we can't get house parties going, events going, sometimes with she's beautiful when she's angry, but also with one of the projects that has been going on for about seven years, and that is the screening and discussion of a very important documentary called Absolutely Safe. Now, how many of you know that documentary? Oh, dear, not enough for this group. Well, you can all get a free copy. That's the first step. You take my card or take a newsletter. Our website's on the newsletter. Uh, it's a film about breast implant safety. And despite the fact it was done seven, eight years ago, it's as relevant today as it was then because we have not done due diligence by women in terms of doing perspective trials, really well done studies that would establish the safety, particularly of silicone gel breast implants. Now, those of you who knew Esther knew that after menstruation and anatomy and physiology, the next issue, and she worked so closely with Jane Zones at the National Women's Health Network and with Sybil Goldrich with Command Trust, the, the next issue that obsessed Esther was breast implant safety. And originally it was around even saline breast implants. They all rupture. But saline rupturing into your body didn't produce the set of problems that many women had when saline implants ruptured. And the fact that we do not have good enough data right now to prove cause and effect doesn't mean that thousands of women aren't out there with major problems. And I have just connected with a few physicians in New York who've been begging the FDA to take silicone gel breast implants off the market. There are a few outliers in this field, 
um, who know about plastic surgery. They also know about women's health, and a few rheumatologists who have really looked carefully at the fact that these women really are ill. It's not in their heads, and just because we don't have the nomenclature yet, because we haven't done the research we need to do, doesn't mean that the women who've had this whole host of serious problems from ruptured silicone breast implants doesn't mean that they aren't really ill. And Esther was one of the first people to think about this. She had a breast implant support group. And I must tell you one story. Uh, an older woman, she's actually Armenian, so I knew her, um, a little bit older than I am, maybe by 15, 20 years. She had a silicone implant that ruptured. She was at Mass General Hospital going from bad to worse. Nobody knew what it was. Her elderly mother, one of the genocide survivors, Armenian genocide survivors, walks in, and this is many years ago, probably in the 80s, and she screams at the other family members and the doctors, and, she, and in broken English, she basically says, don't you know what's wrong with her? It's those things in her breasts. You take them out, and she'll get better. And you know what? They took them out, and she did get better. And I have had many stories like that, um, similar to the um, stories you might hear from people who have statin drug problems and are really suffering from you know, brain fog and loss of balance, and nobody really connects the two, even though the literature is filled with stuff on statin drugs. Women and men I've known who've gone off their statin drugs and regained um, the ability to at least leave a hospital. Um, and those, you know, it's an example of their good uses and bad uses for some drugs. In this case, one can argue that for silicone gel breast implants, probably it's just an accident waiting to happen for so many women. So Esther is um, the person who instilled in me a real interest in this issue. And when she died, I decided that I would continue to do what she had started. And when this film got done some years later, I became very friendly with the filmmaker, and we got a grant. Um, through the um, Common Benefits Litigation Trust. Remember the settlement money from Dow Corning. And we've had several grants to take the film, show it in college campuses, give free films out to those who want to use the film in their church or their dorm or whatever, continue to do this kind of educational work, um, create this kind of discussion. And I'll tell you, there are amazing stories to tell there from these screenings and discussions boyfriends who were trying to convince their girlfriends not to get breast implants, but they did anyway because everyone in this sorority was. And the young man came up to me and said, and I thought boyfriends had influence over their girlfriends, you know. He said, it's the societal message that really counts. And it, it, there were just so many facts. And a woman who was in Las Vegas who was a an exotic dancer who was just about to get breast implants came and saw the film, and she went to Carol and basically in tears said, Thank you for doing this film because I know now that one of my customers last week who told me not to do it because everybody else did, of course, you know, Las Vegas is Silicon City, Silicon City, um, she decided she wouldn't do it. And the film lynched, it, it really clinched it for her. So we're going to continue to do this work, and I've continued to do it. And if Obos doesn't keep going, if we have to fold somewhere, this work is going to continue somewhere, maybe out of this organization, because I know as long as the settlement money is there, they're very pleased with the conversation and the educational value. We've not only brought this issue to the forefront for college students, we've used it as a great example of when absence of evidence of harm is not the same as proof of safety. And the next best example you can imagine is egg extraction, multiple egg extraction, so-called egg donation. So there's a lot of um, sort of egg provision for pay. And many young women who are going in to make money to pay for their graduate school tuition fees are led to believe it's a perfectly safe procedure. Well, some of the drugs used, we actually don't even have FDA approval for their use in this context. But there's some major questions to be asked about long-term effects of so-called um, egg extraction procedures, and it's not the surgical part, it's the hormonal use up front where you suppress ovarian function and then you have controlled hyperstimulation with the hyperstimulatory drugs. There is one place in the United States that has a registry. It's not prospective work, but you can still collect a lot retrospectively. It's at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. They even have a grant from the Society excuse me, for the, from the ASRM, American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Very few members 
of the ASRM actually participate in this registry? And that is a very interesting question about why, and I can tell you some of the work our interns have done on this. But the bottom line is every single clinic who cares about evidence-based medicine should be putting up the placard and the little brochures and encouraging anybody, men, women, anybody involved in the ART, assisted reproductive technology procedures, to be participating in this. And it's not just for people who are egg donors. And the take up and the interest in this has been so minimal it has been, I think, an embarrassment to anyone in academic medicine who watches this. The only place, unless it's changed in the last two months, large academic center that has signed up and participates in this IFRR, the Infertility Family Research Registry, is Brigham and Women's Hospital because the head of their fertility center is someone very committed to this kind of evidence-based work. Few other physicians have said they were going to, but I don't think they have yet. I think you should all go back to your cities, look at where your fertility clinics are, call them up and say, are you participating in the Fertility Family Research Registry? I want to just say our bodies ourselves is continuing not only to look at this issue, but also at the growing dilemmas and problems surrounding transnational cross-border commercial surrogacy. It's getting a lot of attention. There is a huge market. And what's happening right now with our global partner in India is that they're seeing many of the brokers go south to Nepal to get women who will charge less money to be gestational mothers. Um, as you can imagine, their rights are not well considered. Their legal rights, whatever they sign, sometimes it doesn't matter. They don't always get the money they're promised. More importantly, they are in many cases forced to sign an agreement, they must have a cesarean section. Bad for the baby, bad for the mom, but this is a convenience factor. So they can time when they come to the country and pick up the baby, and also for other reasons. Scheduling cesareans, as we well know, is a huge and problematic sort of issue. I won't get into that anymore except to say that we are working with global partners on this issue, and we did get a grant from the MacArthur Foundation, which is supporting our work with the Center for Genetics and Society and the PCAR, the uh, Protest Alliance for Responsible Research, which opposed Prop 71 some years back. Um, it's another story I won't get into, but we are very much committed to seeing this issue through. And I want to end with the last thing I want to mention about what we're doing, and that has to do with midwives. And despite the fact we've got volumes of good data on the efficacy, safety, and also, shall we say, satisfaction of families who use mid midwives, what we're seeing in this country is a trend away from midwifery utilization. And I also want to say that um, Dr. Neil Shaw, courageous young OBGYN here at Beth Israel, was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the infamous Dr. Amy Tudor is already blogging all over the place with garbage uh, criticizing him. And he is, the title of his piece is A Nice Delivery, based on the national, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, program in the UK that is monitoring childbirth outcomes very, very carefully over decades. So it's a play on that. A nice delivery, the cross-Atlantic divide over treatment intensity in childbirth. And his conclusion is basically saying, I'm not so sure that home birth isn't such a bad place, given what we do in the hospitals. That's basically the bottom line. He's not saying I'm advocating home birth. He understands why most obstetricians don't. We don't have good transfer arrangements. There's a lot of hostility around this issue. But we have such an an excessive, intensive treatment approach to childbearing that we're doing much more harm than good in many cases. And so he's looked very hard at the data. And this got published in the New England Journal, even though there were edits he didn't like, I think. Um, look at it. And please go out in the blogosphere and support this man. He is getting attacked from real, what I call the loonies out there, not academic medicine types. But, um, but this is, we have a battle right here, and so do about close to half of the states around the country to get certified professional midwives licensed and regulated. Yes, there are disagreements about the quality of the training, but we can resolve that. Way back when CNMs got into the picture and were allowed to practice, their training was way, way less than what we see now. You have to get your foot in the door. And these are the only trained providers offering women and families who choose home birth this option. And it will be the best wedge to force hospitals to change what they do. Don't forget, 
only one or two percent of women are going to want to do home births. But when you have that option, the hospitals then feel forced to change. It's about that as well. I've gone over my time, so I will stop. I don't want you to disappear yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. I saw you out okay. of the corner of my eye. Okay, we have a few other things that are going to have to happen during this hour, so, so don't disappear. But before we do those, we, we have time for a few questions for Judy. So is anyone feeling a, a burning, burning need to inquire? I have one little story. Um, a sexual health colleague of mine who was the executive director of a small Planned Parenthood affiliate in Nova Scotia sent her daughter off to college with a copy of Our Body Ourselves in her suitcase. And when she got there, her daughter called her and gave her hat and said, why did you do that? But as the week, the first couple of weeks of her residency at university went by, young women from all over the floor were coming and borrowing the book and asking if she could borrow it, and then they were sharing it and, and passing it around. And a week or so later, she had to call her mother and apologize and say thank you. It was a great icebreaker at school. <laughs> That's great. That's great. There are some wonderful stories at the 40th anniversary afterwards. People posted many stories, including an OBGYN professor at Yale who talked about discovering the book in his mother's bedroom when he was 12. You should go online and read these stories. Some of them are great. That's what made him want to be an OBGYN. And um, there are actually, if you are interested in learning more about some of the things I said, just put your name and email address there and I'll send you some files and interesting items um, when I get to it in a couple of weeks. And the, piece of paper is right there. And there's a, some old newsletters that you can pick up for the URL for the website and some other things about the film and breast cancer action. But I do hope you all stay in touch and we'll find a way to keep this movement going. Mm -hmm. I wanted to thank you because this is my mom. And when I was growing up, I was very embarrassed and very shy. And I did not want to talk to my mom about anything. Oh, yeah. And she had the book <laughs> in her office. And I used to sneak in at night to read it. And when I had a problem, some discharge, and I did not want to go to my mom, I used to read the book. So thank you. Well, I will relay that to everybody. No, the book has been a friend to a, a lot of young women and young men. And sometimes when parents didn't feel comfortable, it was a great way, just leaving it on the coffee table. And I talked to a woman once who said it took a week before it was dog-eared. Nobody admitted they were reading it. She didn't say a word. She said, I knew. It was like, you know, friends were coming in. She said, that was just fine with me. I didn't want to embarrass them. And then finally, one of the kids, a friend of her daughter's, came up to her and said, you put that on the table, didn't you? And she said, that's the best book I've seen. You know, so she got a direct thank you. Um, Yes. Um, you guys have been phenomenal ambassadors for the spreading word, the word about themselves and kind of getting knowledge out there. But what are you guys doing to engage the younger, the younger generation of people in their you know, teenage years and twenties um, to try and get them to also be ambassadors and you know, spread the book, you know, put the knowledge and get the power to do it? Well, believe it or not, there are feminist clubs in high schools even. And some of them have been in touch, and we've had a few local. We've met with them. Um, many of them are using social media. And Christine Cupaiolo has connected using social media with some of these groups whose audiences are largely teenage girls. One of the projects that we're hoping to get funded, which is um, uh, an attempt to look at the health body image questions that are particularly important for teenagers and young women. It's going to be called something like, you know, healthy at any size or something like that. The fat shaming problem is huge right now. And it's not done. It's not done with any kind of evidence. And uh, how many of you know Saray Walker's new book? She was just in Newtonville at the uh, in Newton Center at Newtonville Books. So diet land, put it down. She's getting a lot of flack from people who don't understand that she is, in fact, using the science that we have on this issue. Um, and I remember in the 80s or early 90s, somebody wrote a book called Fat Can Be Fit. It's much more complicated than your weight. You know, the issue of health depends on so many things. And people who are very thin are often much, much more unhealthy than heavier people. It's really about so many other factors, not just weight per se. So what we wanted to do was create this project. And we may partner with a group in the US, but we want to do it also with our global partners, because these messages 
are going all over the world. And it's not too far away from the massive amount of porn you see. You know, it's the consumption of porn by young men and young women, too, sometimes, that leads to distorted ideas about body image and then what you need to do to achieve that body image. So that leads to unhealthy practices. So you kind of have to do the consciousness raising, the information, straight information about health and well-being. I mean, you know, basic things. You've got to eat decent food and get enough rest and reduce the stress in your life. Well, kind of we all know that, but do we achieve it? Not necessarily. Long-term stress is known to be one of the worst, worst things in a woman's life for her whole immune system functioning. So we have been reaching out in ways that we can. We've been connecting with a lot of younger people who are then taking the message. We have an active exchange. It can come from people who have white hair. Even though there are times young people are fine and they're okay with that, a lot of young people instantly tune out. They actually do have a lot of ageism in them. So it's best when the messages come from their peers. We work a lot with younger individuals who get, they, they don't have that problem. They're not ageist in that sense. But then they know how to use social media and run with the message. So there's a lot of good stuff happening out there. And it's the same thing, you know, for this divestment issue. Young college undergraduates, graduates are doing a, a, an amazing job at becoming more politically effective like on the divestment question. I mean, I know Nancy said you're working at Columbia. You know, it's hopeless at Harvard right now, but we're going to really work hard. And one of the things that is interesting is that we're learning from the whole apartheid and divestment effort back in the early 80s. And some of us actually, you know, closed down the big dinner here at Sanders Theater, and we're on the TV that night. And um, we've been, you know, Harvard was late in that, but eventually it did divest. But it's very similar. You have to make a, a kind of um, critical mass, enough noise that people pay attention. And I think that uh, for many women's health issues, we see those challenges. And I think you've heard it already. You all know that you're working in a field that's understudied, underappreciated, and we have to have some people ringing the bell a little bit louder at times. And if you can make the connection to climate change, we have some people who'll be really good allies because they want to make those connections more and more. Okay. We could keep doing this all afternoon, I'm sure, but we do have some other things we have to do, so I want to thank Judy once again thank for you. sharing her <laughs> ideas with us. And to once again thank our bodies ourselves as a collective for all their work. Yes, thank you. So I'd actually like to ask Jax to come up really quickly. Hold on one second. Oh, Something's happening first. Hey there, everybody. I thought you hadn't heard enough from me yet, so I wanted to get up on stage and talk to you. Um, but first, I'm going to ask uh, Juliana Serena, one of the artists from our art show, uh, a, long, a member of SMCR for as long as I have known her, which is two years, but maybe longer, because I guess I can't tell you. Uh, she is a ceremonialist, a rites of passage a facilitator, and a menstrual cycle educator. Um, and I want to invite her up on stage for one moment. Thank you. Thanks, Jax. So um, I'm actually, I, I'm here to, well, I just thank all of you. Um, it's been a beautiful conference so far, and I'm thrilled with how everything's going. I was thrilled to be accepted, too, to present at the conference this year. It was a huge honor, and I'm still processing how that all went. Um, but what I want to do is um, publicly thank and acknowledge Jen Lewis. Um, so Jen has made, would you come up, Jen? Jen has made um, a, an, an incredible uh, gift to all of us, this commitment, this year and a half process of just selflessly uh, reaching out to artists and really supporting the advocacy work and the, the outreach to the community. Um, art is such a powerful means of communicating and it's really exciting that you've done this. It's just, you are such an inspiration. I'm so glad that you are part of my life and a part of our life in the movement. And so I'd like to give you this card that we had signed by as many of the artists as possible. And so thank you so much, Jen, for everything that you're doing and will continue to do in the name of making menstruation matter for all of us.
right, and just one more moment of your time. Um, so I worked this year uh, with the conference committee here in Boston, and we worked a lot on a lot of things and, uh, and in conjunction with the board and the uh, program committee. Um, and I just, I wanted to recognize the work that our co-chairs have done this year. And I'd like to invite Amy and Chris up to the stage. <laughs> So in my attempt to not cry, I will probably just hug them, but know that they did tireless work all year to make sure that this could happen. Um, and we, <laughs> we have some presents for them that I'm going to make them open on stage. Um, <laughs> um, and we also have some cards that are signed by the board and committee members this year. So. Yes, open, open, please do. <laughs> it's, it's a giant card, everyone. I saw the roll of paper, and I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Still not quite done. Now it goes back. Now it goes back to Chris. But I, I took her by surprise there. I, I stole her show briefly. Come on up, Chris. So, um, well, thank you. That's lovely. Um, so um, it's our turn to recognize and thank just a few folks. We did try our best to acknowledge folks in print in the program, but we wanted a couple special callouts. So first, to our program committee, our transdisciplinary, transcontinental. Um, that is not an easy feat. You imagine how much exercise the doodle poll got to schedule calls of Jane Asher, Jeanette Purs, and Heather Dillaway, with the support of Laurel Metsula. Did I pronounce her name correctly? Thank you. Um, who is uh, not local here, but she did a tremendous amount of work in Sydney. So great thanks to them. <laughs> to our ever efficient awards coordinator, Mindy Urchel. <laughs> we had a social media team, but our social media leads were the smooth and sociable Laura Wurschler and Angela Barney. <laughs> and tonight you'll get to experience the spirited artistry of raffle coordinator Kelly Wren. And Amy, are you ready to come on up? Okay. So in addition to all the other people who are being thanked, and thank you, um, we want to acknowledge, give special recognition for a few members of the team. And it's obviously a real group effort. Um, first, I want to acknowledge, is she here, Allison? Allison Tejeda has been the coordinator. She's coordinated everything related to this conference and actually making it happen 
all, the fact that all the food was here, the fact that all the drinks were here, the fact that chairs were here, <laughs> the fact <laughs> the table, you know, everything that actually, you know, physically and mentally made it happen. Um, we want to thank Jen for that, and we just have Wait, a little. Allison, Allison. Did I say Jen? I'm sorry. No. Allison. <laughs> Al we want to thank Allison for. Allison, please we come wanna thank up Jen here. Please come up. We have a little, a little token for you. Can, this is? Can I? So. The next one that I want to thank, and Jen, you have we have already you've already been thanked by the artists, but we want to thank you on behalf of the committee. Come on up again. Come on up. We have a little something, just a token of our appreciation. You have made your work along with all the other artists, you have made this conference so much richer and so much more of a holistic experience. Um, we want to thank you for it, and for everybody here, I'll just tell you all what it is, you won't get too into it. Um, these are tampon earrings made by Josephine Herstock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I give it back to Chris. Oh, no, no. Oh, I'm doing this one? I'm not giving it back to Chris quite yet. Okay, we have had the best committee, uh, the best local committee, um, working sometimes 24-7 mm -hmm. to get all the details done and you know put together the packets and just do a million things. Um, so we want to thank. What are you doing this part? I'm not, I'm well. <laughs> okay. We, we're now wives, you know. We yeah. and yeah. Cheryl. Then Cheryl, here. please come on up, Cheryl. Stephanie. Where's Stephanie? And Shay. And Shay. Shay, come on up. Yes. Yes, we're keeping them. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the end of our special recognitions. Thank you for your patience. This is so important to us that we acknowledge publicly the labor, the blood, sweat, and tears, and I do mean blood, sweat, and tears. It's not a conference without the puns, right? Um, that of, uh, so, so much of the work is invisible, right? And it's behind the scenes, and I think our feminist passion, we have to make visible that, that labor that so often gets neglected. You know, like the schlepping of the coffee and the cleaning up of the room and so on. So I'd like to bring two folks up, Jax and Brittany. So Brittany is um, actually the department manager of my department, Women's and Gender Studies at UMass Boston. And she um, is brilliant in that role, and I don't use that word casually. I'm not British, so when I use it, I really mean brilliant. Sorry, I don't think, that was a not a nice thing to say, but um, sorry, my apologies to the folks in the UK, Chella, please don't take, okay. Um, so Brit Brittany works beautifully in that role, and because of that, I reached out to her and I said, could I hire you for next to nothing to manage, to set up and manage our registration process. And she, being Brittany, said, of course. And she was cheerful and lovely and way underpaid and um, didn't complain about that at all. And so as these things happened, she set up the registration process, which took technical know-how and patience. And then she ended up basically becoming our third 
organizer. Um, and I, I could not, I would not have time to list all the detailed tasks that she, or to detail all the tasks that she took on under the supposed rubric of a registration manager. And you've seen that she and Shay have been here every day of this conference, every hour of this conference. That is a big deal. So, of course, there's no gift that can recognize that. So this is a piddly little token that she can put to use, we hope, and uh, with our absolute bottomless gratitude. Yeah. So we left the two green-haired folks for the end, I see. See how we did that? I know. It's a coincidence, I promise you. Um, so the last re special recognition is for Jax. And, oh, Jax. So Jax, Jax moved to Boston to study at Brandeis. And um, we, she took a class that I co-taught with Norma Swenson from Obos in the fall. And we've been in touch because she's, she, is, she is what I study. She is the real deal menstrual activist. So we've had a relationship. Are we going to cry now? We're going to cry now. Uh, we've had a relationship through that for uh, several years now, kind of a mutual fangirl thing, I think I can say, right? Um, okay, here it comes. Um, <laughs> it's sort of like a hot flash or, or a contraction. I'm not sure which it is. Um, so it, long story short, when she came to Boston, she said, well, when she knew she was coming to Boston, she said, well, I'd like to join the program committee or the, the conference committee. I said, well, of course, of course, of course. I had no idea what, I, what, what she was signing up for. So not only did she produce every graphic image you see, she designed, I wish I had, well, I do. She designed, <laughs> I do, it's right here. She designed this logo or this graphic and all its, all its iterations. I said to her, I want to represent something, something intersectional. I was on the T one day, I texted her and I said, you know, we're in Boston, the T, the lines, let's do it. She made it happen. And she has done all the visuals. So plus, she has gone to Whole Foods and picked up coffee. She got us a beer donation. Yeah, she did. <laughs> Jack's Free Beer Gonzalez is what her new name is. <laughs> and, and like Brittany, I could go on and on and on. The point is that she's gone way above and beyond while being a full-time student and having a job. All of this for us. So Jax, thank you. Thank you so much. This is our guess what? It's a Jen Lewis. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you, Jax. We did not know that we were giving each no. other a Jen Lewis. No, we really did it. Here, here, here's oh, wow. your bow. Here's your bow. Close your Jen. Let's wait. <laughs>